my wife uh, who usually helps me here is um, away at the moment and uh, in another city uh, and um, so she had to get us started and so now that we're started we can continue here very Inshallah. good i'll be able to finish it so alhamdulillah bismillahirrahmanirrahim so ladies and gentlemen and dear friends brothers and sisters and whoever else is out there and, and out anywhere in any of those many dimensions that we seem to be interwoven with who are listening may it please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enlighten us all by means of this conversation now we've been talking with uh, brother leslie terabesi or otherwise known as abdul karim who's in uh, kuala lumpur malaysia uh, but has been halfway around the world for many reasons this way and that way and the other way from canada via some place in eastern the eastern maze of europe there you see um right. and uh, i i i'm my roots are also in poland i met uh, an old fella when i was in the the, the army in Germany, uh, just going back 50 years ago. And he said that uh, he recognized my name. He was a librarian. And as I was signing out on the book, he recognized my name. And he said, I know there was a Jewish family in Poland with that name. Yeah. Yes, he knew them. So we talked a little bit about that. So anyway, I couldn't get to visit Poland. Did you ever get uh, back home, uh, you know, where you were, were born? dear brother yeah actually in 1983 16 years after leaving Czechoslovakia I went back on my own to see my dad uh -huh. how do I put it um I was kind of breaking up with a girlfriend I had at the time and there was this feeling of emptiness uh, yes. <laughs> and I first wanted to go back to my roots you know <laughs> something familiar and, and you know that is always there for me so to speak Comforting. so that's yes. how yeah, and then the following year, actually, I, I told my brother about my trip and he became so enthusiastic, mm -hmm. he also wanted to go. So mm -hmm. we arranged for another trip the following year and he got to meet all his friends there and they were indirectly my friends too. And in fact, he met his next wife there. There was a lady that, that came so? from high school. Oh, very fruitful yeah. meeting. <laughs> yeah, so, so now so. he's in Canada and yeah, so it was amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful. Well. So here we are, a couple of white guys from Eastern Europe, at least our ancestors are right now. And uh, I've also spent time in Malaysia, so that's where Brother Karim and I first met some several years ago. And we we're surprised to see ourselves back in touch now, but Allah has his ways of uh, doing things with us. And uh, once they're done, and once you know what the direction is and especially the purpose you need to follow through with it and um, so that's what we're doing we've been talking about the history of Islam so far and the struggle between those who have become traditionalists versus the can I I, I can say the rationalist without going into a, a radical position I think but um, th this is a struggle that's been going on between people who refuse to just accept what someone else says and they want to use their own uh, gray matter to reason things out uh, based on not just what someone says is knowledge but based on what their own experience of knowledge is in this domain and other domains as well. So we have different opinions on what happened um, to Islam and uh, we have different factions and all of you know that we have now <clears throat> the proverbial 72 or 73 sects and only one of them is true and so we're trying to sort out with this conversation and other conversations that I and other people like ourselves are, are having what happened to this thing that we call al-Islam. I have people telling me, now I'm a convert and I'm not an Arabist, so I have to depend on uh, people like uh, Brother Karim and, and others who are steeped in the culture and steeped also in the language of al-Quran to 
sort of sort things out for me as I'm trying to discern the scripture through that medium of other people because I can't read it myself, you see. And even if I could read it myself, I'm not sure that I would trust what I was reading uh, based on my own knowledge of um, or my own inabilities with language. So anyway, we have people who are using their minds to sort things out. And uh, they're saying, oh, no, that couldn't be true because it doesn't align with the Quran. And there are others who say, well, you know, we have this set of traditions here, just like other religions have their traditions, their parascriptural traditions, all right, which means that they're not part of the revealed so-called canonized text, but they're parascriptural and they're, in some sense, hearsay. And so we have them saying, well, these traditions are more important and more significant than the scripture itself. And then they made, <clears throat> they've made actual legal rulings about this, which have affected the lives of millions, if not billions of people by now over the last 1400 years, based on assumptions <clears throat> that these unreliable sources that are now sanctified, you see, are true. And uh, basically, using the, the, the common term that my, my stepson likes to use all the time when he gets excited, wants to tell me something, basically, you know, <laughs> basically, um, something's wrong, isn't it? Something's wrong. Because uh, after all this time, there's still this chaos and confusion and disagreement and people are still trying to anathematize others for not being on the same page with them. Well, I, I can take this one step further before I hand the microphone over to you, dear brother, because I have a specific question. Um, if I take the position that, um, I don't agree with you. I can still walk away and leave you in peace. But these people don't want to. And that's a sign of psychopathology, you see. Now, when it's on a mass basis, that's, that's mass hypnosis, if you will, mass uh, transformation. Um, so we have, um, we have a, um, a conundrum here, you see, when we're when we're dealing with this, because you've got people who swear that they're being guided, and yet they're willing to kill you, anathematize you, throw you out, marginalize you, because you don't believe the same thing that they believe about their particular approach to religion. This is not peace. This is a, a form of tyranny. And uh, when it happens on that basis, when you have so many people ready to trample you, just at the sound of a rumor, oh my God, that woman just burnt the Koran. And all you gotta do is shout it out in the theater, fire, fire. And everybody's running. And they trample over each other and do irreparable damage in the cause, in what they think is the cause of Allah. So I'm just opening up this can a little bit further here, brother, after this break that we've had, because I want to ask you a question now. How are you experiencing this struggle in this day? I mean, I mean, con this in our contemporary time, we've talked about the history. What's going on now? in uh, the way that you perceive this um, this um, hemming and hawing back and forth between these extremes of, you know, this is the sanctified tradition and this is the Quranist tradition. So it's kind of like, you know, going left to right, left to right again, over and over again. Then where's, where's the balance? Is anybody seeking the balance here, dear brother? 
Yes, thank you, Brother Omar, and uh, thanks once again for having me on your very excellent show, and I was uh, looking forward to being back on it. We were away in Lebanon, actually, for uh, some time, attending, uh, how do I put this, um, let's call it a family function, and uh, then when we came back to Malaysia, we stayed mostly in Beirut, but we visited other areas as well, and then... When we came back to Malaysia, we spent another, another 10 days or so with the, uh, the part of the family that uh, we are talking about here. My daughter doesn't want me to talk about it. Oops, I already just mentioned her name. <laughs> so sorry. But anyway, uh, so I want to keep it a low profile. I don't know whether you can edit that comment out about my daughter. Maybe you can because I, I, she might be angry with me if she sees this. But anyway, so uh, that's partly why I was absent. But, um, yeah, before I begin, uh, let me just do my customary little door. I just need a few seconds. Thank you. Of course, brother. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, right, and... Um, yeah, you raised many questions, and, and they are all valid, and they all need to be answered. Uh, I'm not sure which may be the best order uh, in which to answer it. Um, would you like to put any question at the very top of the... the, the no, no, uh, you just follow, shoot from your hip, brother. All right, all right. So, okay, uh, shooting from the hip, that requires a lot of practice. <laughs> That's <laughs> I hope I don't need they don't recommend don't it either. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, spontaneity is important, but then so is the methodology. And we need to strike a balance. Okay, the word balance, yes. right. Is anyone trying to do anything about uh, restoring the balance? And I have good news. Yes. Actually, there are some okay. people trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the late uh, Dr. Uh, Taha Jabir Alwani, the former director of the Triple IT Institute, uh, located in Herndon, Virginia, USA, in fact, mm -hmm. wrote a book that was published in 2017 called, uh, believe it or not, Reviving the Balance. He uses the word balance oh. in the, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and the subtitle runs something to the effect uh, that there needs to be, uh, we need to recalibrate or reset perhaps is that although he doesn't use that word the relationship between the quran and the sunnah because this relationship has been i think and he, i i am referring partly to him has been uh, not established properly you see uh, and uh, th th there's much evidence to indicate uh, this and shahrur also alludes to this this uh, grave error i think among the mufassirun the ulama who placed basically placed tradition above revelation when they declared that the Sunnah, which to al-Shafi is the same as the Hadith, when they declared that the Sunnah judges the Qur'an. So the Arabic expression says, a Sunnah kadia ala Qur'an. Now this was a principle of tafsir, I think attributed to a scholar by the name of Awzai, whose madhab, according to Yusuf al-Qadavi, has become, quote-unquote, obsolete. That's the word that he uses. Uh, but still, many scholars still stick to this, uh, this idea from Shafi that the Sunnah explains, clarifies the Quran, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, I think this is a very problematic proposition because what, what they have done when they elevated the Sunnah to be a judge a judge is always in a superior position to that which is being judged, right? So here yes. they are uh, claiming that they are going to be judging the words of Allah, yes. our Creator and the Supreme Authority, uh, you know, uh, there is in the universe or anywhere else. So they are basically subordinating the words of Allah to the words of human beings. In other words, to the various hadiths that allegedly help to clarify and explain the Quran. Now, uh, you know, explain, uh, again, is based on a second false assumption or a serious misstep in the methodology of uh, traditional tafsir and jurisprudence. And not only Tahajabir al-Wani, but even his colleague and friend and former rector of the International Islamic University of Malaysia here, 
uh, the, he was the second rector, uh, he, they both agree that there is a serious problem with the methodology in uh, traditional Islamic studies. And uh, I mean, for example, uh, Abu Sulaiman, Abdul Habib Abu Sulaiman is the fellow that I'm referring to, the second fellow, claims that we, we are taking the words of the Sahaba as if they were equal to or even superior to what the Prophet allegedly uttered, and that the, the, these statements have become unquestionable or even sacred. Uh, uh, John Esposito of Georgetown University wrote in one of his <coughs> papers that there was an you know, uh, Indonesian scholar by the name of Nurkolis Majid, who called for what uh, Esposito referred to as the, I quote, desacralization of tradition, end of quote. And I think this, this is a well taken point because the problem with tradition is that it has become a competitor of revelation, it has become a partner of revelation, it has become a judge of revelation, and it has become sacred, in other words, uh, holy or divine. And this, I think, was a huge mistake. Uh, and in fact, there's a sheikh in uh, Saudi Arabia who I actually quite like. His name is Hassan Farhan al-Maliki. I'm not sure if he is still in prison. Hassan Farhan al-Maliki. He has some excellent videos on, on uh, YouTube, and most of them are in Arabic, but some of them have English subtitles. He's a sort of Quran-centric chap, and he himself, in one of his videos, that means that he used to, I quote, worship the Hadith, end of quote. Now, this is just <laughs> unbelievable. So what has happened is that even one of my early books on a subject, I think, is entitled How Tradition Eclipsed Revelation. In other words, the Hadith have in some ways become more important than the Book of Allah, and that should never, ever happen. Yet, because of the traditional methodology, this has transpired and it has to be set right. Now, just to give a couple of examples of how this came about, the at least Al the, the, the Muslims, uh, Mufassirun, the Shafis and the Hanafis in particular, uh, came to the conclusion that, collectively more or less, that the Quran, uh, the Book of Allah, contains some ambiguous words. Now, they had the what shall I say, audacity, or I don't know how they came to this conclusion, because Allah Ta'ala states very clearly <laughs> that his book is a clear book. And we would not expect a lack of clarity in a book authored by none other than Allah, because that would imply that he did not express himself uh, basically clearly, and that he needs assistance from some someone to help him make himself clear. Now, this is a very, very problematic proposition. And Shafi singled out two words, for example, as illustrations of uh, words that are not clear in the Quran. And one of them was the uh, Salah, which is normally rendered as prayer, and the other one is Zakah, which is the, mm -hmm. uh, in the poor Jews, a normal rendition. So now, he, then he justified, he first made an allegation that there are unclear words which runs contrary to the Quran. So he departed from, uh, basically uh, departed, or I don't know whether I should say disbelieved, in the two verses which say, or, or the verses, all the verses which say that the Quran is clear, you see. Now, now to attribute lack of clarity to Allah, I think, is very problematic. But mm. get a hold of this, as we say in Canada. How did the Mufassirun decide whether a verse or a word was uh, clear or not? And I am referring here now to a book called... Uh, published by Cambridge University Press, I think in 2007, if I recall correctly. The book was written by, I think, some Bosnian fellow. His name is Shukriya Hussein Ramic. And the book is called Language and the Interpretation of Islamic Law. And in mm -hmm. that book, he said, he, he reports uh, how the Mufassirun decided whether a verse or a word was clear or not. So this is what he says. I'm paraphrasing, but pretty close to the original. Sure. If they could understand the sentence or the word, then the text was clear. On the other hand, if they could not understand the word or, or the verse, then the word or the verse was unclear. Bingo. So now, <laughs> I had to really, I had to stand back and uh, had to take a deep breath because my goodness. That's the actual that's reverse of what's happened. <laughs> Well, it's their understanding the, that's unclear, not, not exactly, exactly. This never seems to have occurred to them 
that the lack mm -hmm. of clarity was not in the text, but rather someplace else, and more precisely in the brain of the reader, you see. Oh my God, okay. So now instead of take, uh, bl taking the blame themselves for not trying hard enough to understand the text, they try to put the blame on Allah by claiming that, well, he used unclear words. So now, uh, but we are such nice people, we are going to come to uh, <laughs> we have his assistance <laughs> and help him make some... Make make himself no, no, clear, no, okay? No, 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 no. Yeah, but this is this no. brother. This is this traditional Sunni position. Oh so now God. they open the door to the hadith. Uh, mm -hmm. The hadith come to the rescue, and not just a few books, by the way. The the six of uh, books of authentic hadith that you find in the uh, Sunni tradition is just the tip of the iceberg. Yes, in the course. Sunni tr tradition, there are at least fifty four other books. So the total of the Sunni books of hadith are about sixty. And then the so, Shia yeah, don't want let, to... let me just pause you a minute. Go ahead, go I ahead, want to go get ahead. this clear again because all of these names just don't always stick with me. You're saying that Shafi'i and Hanafi got together to take this position that God was unclear and they need to help him make things clear. Well, I'm I'm uh, referring more to the schools of thought. Uh, uh -huh. I'm basically referring to uh, Ramich's book. He mm -hmm. basically, and he has an interesting, uh, you know, uh, I have actually written a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. uh, the Both Shafis and uh, Hanafis agreed, first of all, that there are there's unclear words or unclear expressions in the Quran. But when you look more deeply, uh, he does not, uh, Ramish does not single out Shafi and uh, Abu, uh, Imam al Shafi and Abu Hanifa uh, directly. Uh, but mm -hmm. he, he refers to their schools, their, their mashabs, their schools of thought. That's how he puts it. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. interestingly, the, the uh, uh, Shafis uh, <clears throat> divided all words into two classes, clear and unclear. And mm -hmm. then under the clear words, the, the Shafis have two subcategories, and under the unclear, they have two categories also. So altogether, the, the uh, Shafis have six categories of words. Now, the Hanafis went further. Like the Shafis, they also differentiate all words into clear and unclear, which as I'm arguing is already a mistake because there are no unclear words in the Quran. There are only misunderstood words in the Quran, but that's, we can come back to that later. So anyway, the Shafis follow the, uh, I mean, the Hanafis follow the Shafis, sorry, like this, Hanafis, Hanafi came before our Shafi. So mm -hmm. the Hanafis share with uh, the, the Shafis the view that all words are divided into clear and unclear, but unlike the, um, the uh, Shafis who only put two subcategories for uh, mm -hmm. each clear and unclear, the uh, the Hanafis, I believe, they have all together uh, uh, three. I need to double check this. Three subcategories, so for a total of eight classes of words. Mm -hmm. And in each school of thought, whether it's uh, Hanafi or Shafi, the, the so-called uh, mutashabihat verses, which both render incorrectly as ambiguous or unclear, because the, the word mutashabihat does not mean unclear; it means allegorical. Tashabahat mm kulubuhum is a term in uh, expression in the Quran, which means their hearts are similar. So the word mutashabiyat implies a similarity or allegory or perhaps metaphor, but it is not unclear. In fact, in literary works, allegories are normally used to make the meaning of something more rather than less clear. So mm -hmm. here the, there are several problems. One, the allegation that there are unclear words or verses in the Quran. Two, a misrendition of uh, one of the such verses as, uh, you know, uh, the word mutashabihat. So, but what the, the significance of these missteps, the claim that the Quran contains unclear words, and therefore we need to go to the Hadith to bring us clarity. And uh, Shafi, now I'm speaking personally of, uh, about him, and this is, uh, he singles out two words, like I said, uh, solah and zakat, and he claims that the Quran does not tell us how many rakat we have to perform, right? So, mm -hmm. in other words, he makes a second allegation here that the Quran is incomplete, you see, that yes, there's something right. missing, yeah. from, which is another mistake and not a small mistake because it contradicts what Allah says on the subject. Allah says that the Quran is not only clear, has a kitab mubin, but it is also complete. We have explained everything, kulishai, in uh, in this book in detail. You see, mm -hmm. 
Yes. So here the, the, the scholars are making two claims that run directly contrary to what Allah says in, in the Quran. Now, some of the traditional scholars are prepared to de declare a person a kafir if he disbelieves in a single verse. But what are these gentlemen doing here? Already, quote unquote, disbelieving in uh, two uh, two uh, statements or two principles okay. stated in, in the Quran in several places, by the way. This is not stated only a single time that the Quran is clear and that it is, you know, uh, uh, fully detailed. Uh, like, for example, Surah Al Kamar, Surah 54, mm -hmm. in verses 17, uh, 22, 40, and one other word, uh, uh, 28, I think, and 40, declares that we have made this, Allah says, we have made this Quran easy to understand and remember. Mm -hmm. The Quran, this is another, I think, problematic uh, assertion that traditional scholars make about the Quran when they claim that it is a difficult book. It is not. The mm -hmm. tafsir is what is difficult, if you ask me. And the hadiths mm -hmm. are much more difficult to understand than the Quran. The hadiths themselves require, if you like, uh, some kind of explanation or interpretation. <laughs> but to bring that which is lower, the hadiths, to explain that which is uh, higher, the word of God, mm -hmm. is really uh, a travesty, really. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I'm suggesting here is that unfortunately our traditional scholars, or some of them, can I use a little bit of Canadian uh, colloquial English here? I would say that they, some of them messed up real bad. And, uh, and we need to, f with the methodology, you see, mm -hmm. because uh, these, uh, these allegations that the Quran is unclear, that it is incomplete, basically by making those, what I consider to be uh, false statements, I'm not saying that they deliberately lied, but they were statements that are completely contradicted contrary to what Allah says in the book. But by mm -hmm. making these allegations about the Quran, basically they are alleging that the Quran is less than perfect. But we are informed by Allah Ta'ala that this is a perfect book, you see. And there's, mm -hmm. uh, if it was from other than Allah, we would find a lot of contradiction here. Uh, there. Mm -hmm. And that's another statement that, another allegation the scholars uh, make. They, they claim that there are many contradictions in the book. My goodness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are they suggesting that Allah somehow contradicted himself uh, according well, to Shah Waliullah, there were only, and they bring the, in the uh, doctrine of abrogation to take care of this uh, alleged, uh, uh, of these alleged self-contradictions in the Quran. Shah Waliullah yeah. claims there are only five cases of abrogation, but others uh, claim there are as many as 200 and some even claim a higher number mm -hmm. than that. So this is not a very major, major error in traditional exegesis. The assumption, the, the, the allegation, I would say the, shall I say the false allegation that the Quran contains contradictions. It is actually these statements that the Quran is unclear, incomplete and uh, incoherent basically. They, are, they amount to besmirching the Quran. They, they amount to belittling the Quran. They amount to making the Quran uh, look as if it was from a human beings. Because yes, we human beings are sometimes unclear. We human beings sometimes forget to include details. And we human beings sometimes contradict ourselves. But Allah is not like that. You see, mm -hmm. he is always clear. He mm -hmm. uh, always gives us the complete information and he is always coherent. So. The, these three assumptions on which traditional tafsir is based are uh, uh, completely wrong. And uh, the result is that our understanding of the Book of Allah has become corrupted. Because by, op by making these false statements, the last one opened the door to the doctrine of abrogation, but the first two opened the door to the, the hadith, to bring in the hadith to help clarify and complete the Quran, right? As if mm -hmm. the Quran was imperfect. So this is the, this, the, a very serious problem in the method, traditional methodology of reading the Quran, and it has to change. The Ummah, as you know, is experiencing, uh, experiencing all kinds of trials and tribulations, and they stem in part from a misunderstanding, a perhaps misrepresentation of the Book of Allah that is supposed to provide guidance to the Ummah. But the Ummah, somehow, the, the Book of Allah was not enough. They wanted something more. Even the pro people at the time of the Prophet used to tell him, uh, bring us a different Quran or change this. Right? There's a mm -hmm. verse in the Quran mm -hmm. according to the okay. Well, he said, I cannot change it of my own will. So what did they do? Well, they brought something else. They brought the books of Hadith, which, by the way, they claim are also revelation, brother. So they are claiming sanctity to, and they are placing these books of Hadith on par with the book of Allah. 
they are placing the words of human beings uh, and they are making them equal to the words of God. And in some cases, they are even elevating the words of the human beings above the word of God. And they do it, it when I said, when they apply this methodology of explaining the Quran by the Hadith, as Sunnah Qadi ala Quran, what they are doing is that they are placing their own furqan or criterion or standard for differentiating truth and falsehood. They are pla placing this uh, man-made furqan above Allah's furqan. Now, uh, I was uh, racking my brains over what, what do you call this because I haven't come across any uh, anything any expression in the literature that refers to this phenomenon that identifies it as a practice. And I, uh, I, I came up with the expression scriptural shirk. When you give a partner to the book of Allah, you are committing another book. When you are treating another book or books as equal to the book of Allah, you are committing what I would say you are falling into what I would describe as scriptural shirk or textual shirk. You are giving partners to the book of Allah. Now, a follow-up question could be, is it possible to give a partner to the book of Allah without giving a partner to Allah himself, you see? So what I'm suggesting here is that traditional tafsir is basically uh, tainted by this uh, 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 scriptural shirk. And it doesn't end there. The same happens, something very similar happens in jurisprudence, where the rulings of Allah, jurisprudence is about law, the ahkam of the sharia. In jurisprudence, uh, rulings of Allah have been arbitrarily replaced, abrogated, and replaced by uh, rulings drawn from man made traditions. Mm -hmm. And we have examples, three major examples. The ruling on apostasy in the Quran was replaced by the death penalty drawn from the Hadith. That is another example of what I, uh, this is an example of what I, let me give the second and third example first. The second example is when the stoning to death replaced the ruling of a hundred lashes for adultery. And uh, the third example is when uh, no punishment for blasphemy was replaced by the death penalty of blasphemy. Now, in all these three cases, human beings were allowed by the ulama to overrule the word of Allah. In other words, the ulama have in these three cases allowed people, the narrators or the transmitters of the hadith, because we cannot even... We cannot take it for granted that these words of the Hadith are the words of the Prophet. We know that the Hadith are paraphrases of paraphrases of what the Prophet allegedly said. So we should not attribute it to, to, to him. Uh, we, we should not hold him. Uh, he, I don't think he did it, but some of the transmitters, uh, you know, uh, I think transmitted these Hadiths, and these Hadiths were then used to, believe it or not, abrogate and overrule the, the clear rulings of the Quran. In other words, human beings were elevated above God because they were made into authorities higher than God himself. They had, mm -hmm. the ulama have given them power to overrule God's rulings. Now, what is this? How would yeah. you describe that such a practice? So I came up with the uh, uh, sister expression, and I'm calling it a jurisdic shirk. Uh, uh, when the fuqaha have, fall, have fallen into this trap of treating, the in some cases, the words of human beings as more authoritative, and a source of legislation as more authoritative than the words of God, that this is a terrible catastrophe. And it explains why Islam is, uh, explains uh, some, uh, the, a part of the Islamophobia that we see around us, be, uh, and it explains uh, some of the extremism you see that we have, uh, even in the Sharia, because mm -hmm. death penalty is an extreme penalty. And if it is prescribed for something that Allah never prescribed the death penalty for, then I would say whoever prescri is prescribing this death penalty is going into extreme. And I, in fact, am prepared to call him, whoever did that, an extremist, you see? Mm -hmm. yes. So this has brought, uh, you know, untold misery to the, to the Muslims, wars and civil wars. And Lebanon had its share of them. Uh, I was just uh, preparing some text. Uh, which I will be publishing uh, in uh, hopefully not too distant the future. The amount of sectarian violence, brother, in Lebanon is just unbelievable. The, the Christians alone have something like 12 denominations there. But anyway, to come back to the, the main point, I think the ulama bear a degree of responsibility for all these fratricidal wars and civil wars because of their, uh, what shall I say, extremism, their extreme uh, exegesis, which is uh, uh, departs from the teaching uh, of the Quran, the moderate teaching of the Quran. So I could go on longer, but I don't want to take up too much time. But I will just mention that another major corruption that happened based on the doctrine of abrogation was the invention of the aggressive jihad spreading Islam by the sword. 
This is yes. an, a, another unbelievable principle. And who came up with it? Well, among other people, Imam al Shafi, sorry to say. Mm. Uh, according to a book by Abu Zahra, where he's quoting Ibn Taymiyyah, even Ibn Taymiyyah agreed that Shafi was the only one uh, out of the four Imams who basically uh, endorsed killing non Muslims just because they are not Muslims. In other words, not because they are attacking you know, the Muslims. But mm -hmm. so the, 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 he approved this doctrine of jihad al talab aggressive war, offensive war. He, he personally Imam have even it. made it into a six pillar of Islam. Now, how catastrophic can it be? And, and just two more. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if you would like evidence of this, well, have a look at a book called uh, Tackling Takfiri Theology. You can find it on Academia. It was published by the Quilliam Foundation. Majid Nawaz is mm -hmm. uh, a part of that uh, or organization. And the book was authored by uh, Usama Hassan, who sometimes writes for The Guardian, and Saleh Ansari. An excellent book. It is basically uh, a I, I remember to reading the, Security uh, Chief I, Ideologue. I, of, I I remember reading security briefs there. I edited security briefs uh, while I was in Kuala Lumpur because they had uh, yeah, they involved with the, yeah, with so the, the terrorists there. And they yeah. attributed, I, I, don't re, I don't remember them citing Shafi, for example, but they did attribute this Takfiri mentality to early schools of Muslim thought during the first a couple of centuries it, it's it's there you see this idea that they can just indiscriminately kill you see murder uh people who are quote unquote non-muslim you see so uh, this is not news to me that, that shafi sort of is uh, one, one of those who originated that i think people need to understand that <laughs> because most students are not aware of, first of all, uh, of the gravity of that ruling or that he's responsible, you see. This is one of the things I'm glad we can clear, clarify for uh, some of our readers. And um, I don't want to get, uh, we, we've covered this um, illegal uh, killing and wars uh, extensively in the past, but I have another question I want to ask you because um, there are political motivations that others whom I've talked to have made clear. And these are people who understand the history of the Middle East, the history of Islam, the history of these other cultures and uh, that were in religions that are involved in how these things uh, sort of work. So there was a political motivation that, that stems out of those um, pseudo Christian, Catholic, Orthodox, and um, uh, old uh, corrupted um, Zoroastrian uh, Persians, you know, all got, sort of got together with the disaffected Jews who'd been thrown out of Palestine by then for a thousand years. So all of that is working as an accretion against Al Islam and their political motivations there. That's very clear from several conversations. But I have another question here. You see, the Arabic language is, was not fully developed at the time that um, this, um, the Quran was revealed. I mean, there was a, a high culture of uh, Arabic traditions, but it was all oral. So it, that's my understanding. You know, I, I'm not a linguist and a historian in that sense. So I'm wondering okay how much of a problem was it to take that tradition of yet a still forming language and expression of a verbal exchange and put it into writing how much of that may have contributed uh, to the misunderstandings that you have uh, uh, cited in the last uh, in the last 40 minutes or so what do you think brother
Yeah, thank you. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind when you're talking about language is how Imam al Shafi, basically, once again, Shafi, sorry, I don't have a personal axe to grind against him. Because, <laughs> and by the way, he wasn't the only one who endorsed this doctrine mm -hmm. of Jihad al Talab. Among others, Imam Moha, Abu Hamid al Ghazali also endorsed it. Brandon. Yes, of course, yeah. And also, the, even Khaldun, who wrote the Muqaddimah, I found the passage, uh, you know, in the. I was so was disappointed to hear that. Uh, terrible, terrible. And uh, not to mention, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Said Qutub and Maududi. But anyway, Imam al Shafi is well known. And by the way, did you know that Imam al Shafi would read the Quran uh, from beginning to end, recite the Quran twice a day, every day during Ramadan? Okay. Imam al Shafi, yeah, this was uh, reported about him. He would recite the Quran from beginning to end twice a day, every day during the month of Ramadan, brother. My well, source is looking. Sounds a bit crazy to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, the source of this information, you will find it in Brother Dr. Omar Rama, his book. Uh, I think you had him on your show at least once or more. Uh, in his book called uh, Muslims' Greatest Challenge Choosing Between uh, Tradition and Islam, a brilliant book. I highly recommend that, it. Brother so Rahim. He mentions that. Yeah. And, but, uh, so, but what I, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he writes okay. it in his book. Uh, mm -hmm. It was published, uh, I think, four years ago, at two zero one nine mm -hmm. by Black Palm Press. But anyway, the the thing about Shafi, what gets me, uh, is that he uh, contributed to this misunderstanding by basically, how shall I put it, falsifying the uh, mm -hmm. the meaning of one very important Quranic term. And the Quranic term is the word hikmah, which means wisdom. But he asserted that it actually means the Sunnah of the Prophet, you see, <coughs> which is very, very problematic. Yeah, the mm -hmm. word hikmah means wisdom, it does not mean the Sunnah of the Prophet. The reason why he came up with this shenanigan, I think, is because he wanted to justify turning to the Sunnah as a second source of revelation, as a second source of legislation, if you ask me, as a, what he didn't realize what he was doing is that he was creating a second God by doing this, because only Allah alone has the right to legislate in matters of deen. But be, mm -hmm. and, he's, and he was looking for a passage in the Quran that would justify following the, the so-called Sunnah of the Prophet. He could not find any such passage, so then he invented this notion that the word hikmah actually means the Sunnah of the Prophet. This was... Uh, a very, very, how shall I call it? I'm not saying that he intentionally lied, but I think he was overzealous and he, and he twisted the words. There are traditional uh, ulama who believe that if your intention is good and you are seeking to achieve something good, you can even invent a hadith. The, 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 there's a record of this that some of the ulama mm -hmm. have believed it. Uh, noble uh, lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The noble lie. And there are many noble lies, mm -hmm. actually. When Once you start lifting those mm -hmm. rocks, you will come across many of such lies. So mm -hmm. in this way, by claiming that the word hikmah means the sunnah of the prophet, he encouraged the people to, to read the hadith, to follow the hadith, you see. And be, in fact, he misled the ummah from the book of Allah to the books of hadith. I consider the whole, uh, you know, um, tradition now uh, as a basically a deviation from the book of Allah to the books of tradition. Uh, I know it's a very broad generalization, and I'm sure there are exceptions, but the, the basic, the mainstream position is that Islam has two sources, uh, Quran and Sunnah. And in fact, when you walk into uh, any masjid, you will see two names there. Uh, equal, they look like equal partners. And if you ask me, do, uh, Brother Abdul Karim, do you have a name for that too? Actually, just before, uh, a little while before I, we started this meeting, uh, such a name occurred to me, and I, I would call it now, the, the, the term that came to my mind was, uh, you know, uh, symbolic shirk, because it, mm -hmm. the symbolically putting the two names side by side with the equal size letter symbolizes partnership and equality. Mm -hmm. So this, this is what happened. Uh, the, the Ummah lost its bearings from the time that the uh, Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, the Hadiths were elevated to the rank of equality and in some cases even superiority to the Quran. What I tell my friends and, and interlocutors on Clubhouse is that, look, I don't deny that the Prophet had a Sunnah, even though the uh, Sunnah of the Prophet is not mentioned in the Quran. The Sunnah of Allah is mentioned, and the Sunnah of Awalin is mentioned, of the princesses of Ibrahim, and so on. That doesn't mean 
Uh, however, just because the Quran does not mention a Sunnah of the Prophet doesn't mean he didn't have one. I believe he had one. In fact, in a sense, I consider myself a Sunni because I also follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. But was the Sunnah of the Prophet to follow Bukhari? No. Was the Sunnah of the Prophet to follow Tirmidhi? No. Was the Sunnah of the Prophet to follow uh, Sahih Muslim? No. He couldn't follow any of those people because they didn't exist even during his time. But the mm -hmm. Prophet did follow a certain book, and, that's a, and that book is the Quran, and it is the same book that I also follow. So mm -hmm. whoever follows the Quran is actually following the su real Sunnah of the Prophet. So even the meaning of the Sunnah of the Prophet has been dramatically corrupted and distorted in traditional Islam, which amounted to basically, the whole process amounted to basically a, a, a serious uh, well, a kind of a deviation, basically, from the straight path, abandoning mm -hmm. of the Quran in favor of man-made traditions. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question or not. But um... well, um, that uh, that is a political motivation uh, on the part of those who fail to understand what my um, uh, the religion fail to understand the religion, and then they take on their own selfish motivations. They become one of the selfish ones and then politically organize against the cause of Allah in the earth, which is for us to become mature and attain unto the office of Khalifa. So the thing that uh, I, I was trying to get to when I asked the question is how much of the transition from the oral tradition to the written tradition when they were transcribing the Quran, did this linguistic problem contribute to Muslim, early Muslim understanding? It seems to me that uh, there was probably, and this is how it is with most of the so-called initiates or prophets um, over the years from whatever the culture might be, they have, there's an inner circle and there are layers of, 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 of sort of groups of people who uh, are closer or further away from uh, intimate relationships uh, with the, both the, the prophet, the bringer of the uh, uh, the scripture, or the bringer of the news, whatever the revelation might be, and the understanding of it. Those closest will have a greater understanding. So I'm thinking that there's there may have been a linguistic factor that contributed to a misunderstanding uh, when the tradition went from, when the tradition, the oral tradition of the Quran, I'm not talking about the Hadith now, the, of the Quran went from an oral uh, platform to a written platform because um, Arabic was just being established during these centuries as a written language it hadn't the quran is actually one of the things that to my understanding helped arabic to become written you see so um that's what i was asking what do you or do you not know about uh, such a contribution from the that perspective Yeah, you are right that the Quran actually was originally oral uh, in form, and Dr. Ramahi emphasizes this when he refers to the written, the transcript mm -hmm. of the Quran as the Mushaf. Mm -hmm. The Quran is the oral Mushaf. recitation. Yeah. That, is, mm -hmm. that is correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, what I, whether there was any distortion in transcribing the Quran from mm -hmm. the oral uh, form, that is a good question. I haven't really done a whole lot of research on that, but there are people who have pointed it out, some like certain mm -hmm. types of Arabic do not use the diacritical marks, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. They have, they have been added on. So um, there are some differences. I mean, Allah Ta'ala promised to protect the zikr in the Quran. And did mm -hmm. he say that he promised to protect the mushaf, you see? So the zikr, if the Quran is the zikr, then the Quran is protected. But that, does that protection extend to the written you know, copies of the Quran, uh, like ah, Edith yeah, and Yuxo yeah. and others have mm -hmm. got, yes. gotten into some trouble when they claim that the last two verses of Surah number, you know, 9, 128 and 129 have been added on because they seem to contain some problematic statements which mm -hmm. refer to the Prophet as if he were Allah, you know, <clears throat> I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind and merciful, uh, so, so mm -hmm. on. But so, 
But what what uh, what, what I sense in the process of mm. language uh, development uh, and uh, how do I put this? I have written a little bit about language, language and morality, and what it's on my uh, mm-hmm. website. I mean, on uh, Academia and ResearchGate. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I noticed in about language is that apart from falsifications like that done by Shafi, uh, and also other falsifications when the where the word mutashabiyat um, is rendered as uh, you know unclear, or another misrepresentation where the word salah is interpreted as meaning exclusively ritual prayer or ritual prayer chiefly, while people have shown that the word salah has much broader meaning, such as connecting with someone, reaching out to someone supporting someone, being committed to something, and turning to something, and so on and so forth. But what I sense in, and Dr. Ramaha gives a, a, another brilliant example of this change in the meaning when it comes to the word kalb, which is normally rendered as hard uh, in 56 of the 57 translations of the Quran on islamawakened.com. And by the way, I know the fellow who's running that whole thing. He comes to our rooms from time to time. Mm-hmm. They are working on some uh, translations of the Quran, and I think they have translated it already into 120 languages, but that, uh, we can put, put that aside for now. So, in out of f- 56 of the 57 translations, uh, translate mm-hmm. the word kalb as heart. Only one, mm-hmm. and it's a fellow called Shafi, not to be confused with Imam al Shafi, that's another Shafi. Sure. Mm-hmm. He was the only one who translates the word kalb as mind, you see. And this is Dr. Mm-hmm. Ramahi's contention that the, in original Quranic Arabic, the word kalb did not mean heart, it mm-hmm. meant the brain, uh, the brain mm-hmm. or the mind. So when the meaning changed from uh, brain to heart, the understanding of Islam changed from an intellectual understanding to an emotional understanding, you see. Yes. That's, mm-hmm. that's partly why you see so many Muslims ready to stomp on someone uh, on just a mere allegation of having done something like burning the Quran and, and throwing yes. acid in people's faces, being very emotional, in other words, and non-intellectual. So yes. uh, that, that's one major change that has taken place. And according to Ramich, who, who I quoted earlier in that book, uh, Language and uh, Interpretation of Islamic Law, there was at least a half a dozen very key words in the Quranic Arabic that have undergone significant change. So for mm-hmm. us to understand, I mentioned two, uh, one or two examples. So for us to mm-hmm. understand the Quran as it was intended by Allah to be understood, we need to rediscover those, uh, you know, uh, the, the meaning of those words. Words. And in mm-hmm. order to do that, I think we need to free ourselves from traditional tafsir and commentary because as, mm-hmm. for example, once again, Dr. Amahi points out, he thinks that 90, I think 95%, up to 95%, I think is the number he mentioned of tafsir, is really unreliable of the traditional tafsir. It actually muddies the waters rather than clarifies for us the meaning of the Quran. So, uh, in other words, that. this is a major task that... Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And by the way, just one other thing, you see, uh, the, uh, I know you don't want to talk about the Quran, but I think if I may just add that the collection of Hadith was politically motivated because three separate caliphs ordered people to collect the Hadith. One was uh, Ibn Hisham, he ordered someone called Al-Zuhri to collect the Hadith. Uh, Al-Mansur, I think, asked uh, Malik, Imam Malik, to, uh, to collect the Hadith. And then there was Umar II, he also asked someone to, to collect and write down the Hadith, which were mm-hmm. at that time also in a purely oral tradition. And the scholars, according to Tahajah Berawani, objected to doing it because they remembered that the pro- Prophet prohibited writing the Hadith. So yes. according to Alwani, Umar II was the first one who claimed publicly that the Prophet lifted his prohibition on the writing yeah. of the Hadith. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the origin of the Hadith is very political, and the Hadith served mm-hmm. a political purpose, something like political mm-hmm. propaganda, basically to make yes. the enemies of the Caliph look bad and to make the Caliph look good, mm-hmm. and to interpret the deen in such a way that would allow them to go back to their old ways of raiding neighboring countries, the so-called mm-hmm. uh, you know raids, and but this time sure. under the guise of spreading Islam by the sword, you see. Yes, so, they yes, came yes, up yes. with the Hadith like where the Prophet mm-hmm. allegedly said, I was uh, the God bless Prophet Muhammad who was sent with the sword uh, as a mercy mm-hmm. to mankind. Now they added the with the sword to a famous Which, verse in Surah in the Quran, 20, Surah 21, mm-hmm. Anbiya, verse 107, where Allah says, Wa ma lil alamin. We have not sent you but as a mercy to the world. Now show me the word uh, mm-hmm. a sword in that verse, it's not there, you see. So mm-hmm. the point is, Hadith militant, 
a Quran peace war. So this is what the ulama did. They transformed the religion of peace yeah. into a religion of conquest, expansion, and imperial uh, with imperial ambitions. And this was in the long term the downfall of the ummah because eventually yes. they were there was a pushback, as you know. Mm -hmm. And, and and they were the they the the, the 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 empires all collapsed. Whether it was the Umayyad, Abbasid, or the Ottoman, they all collapsed, including yes. the ISIS most recently. So anyway, yes, the the, the meaning changed in, in the in the uh, the uh, our knowledge of of, of of many of many of the words, and we need to rediscover the original meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, whether the change happened uh, when the uh, the Quran itself was being trans transcribed. I really would need to look into it in more detail to be able to comment. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you're not the only I'm one. I'm going to ask that you know. question to. <laughs> I'm going to ask that question to <laughs> several people, uh, for the sake of our listeners, of course, and for the sake of my own edification. And uh, with that um, uh, having been said, and on that note, dear dear brother, I want to thank you once again for sharing your uh, exceptional. Uh, knowledge uh, and opinion based on sound knowledge uh, with us uh, and with myself in particular. Um, I uh, We're undergoing uh, some uh, readjustments here at Alginko at the back end of the website. Um, so um, we can't handle as many programs at the present moment. We might wrap up to it again, ramp up to it again in a couple of months or maybe even sooner so let's try to do this every other week if we can uh, dear brother yeah every other for sure. season, uh, as however it is that we we are, are led so i plan on setting you aside uh, for tuesday in two weeks from now and uh, we'll continue this conversation i might have some more specific questions for you uh, in mind next time, but I'm not going to let you know in advance because I like spontaneity and I like the fact that our audience can sit in and listen to a real conversation that's not uns that's unscripted and without some sort of um, uh, ulterior motivation. All right. Both you and myself were we were about as far from being politically motivated as possible. So, <laughs> I want to thank you once again, my dear brother. Thank you so much. Most welcome, and thank you too. Uh, so we'll Was see you inshallah alaykum. in two weeks. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, in two weeks. Wa salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abdul Karim, thank you. <laughs>